and welcome to the Rivers Online Worship Experience. Uh, my name is Dean Ward, and I serve as the lead pastor of the River Church. And I am so grateful that you have chosen to join in with us here this morning. Uh, you may be wondering why I am sitting in a rocking chair. Well, uh, we're filming the morning after Thanksgiving, and it's about all I have the energy to do. <laughs> I hope your Thanksgiving was great. I hope you enjoyed just a day of goodness, a day of kind of accounting what you are grateful for, and a day living in the realization of God's faithfulness and goodness to you. Uh, I'm also filming in my black and gold. Uh, this is the very first time I think I've worn my leather pants on uh, the filming. I don't think I've ever done that before. Uh, little story behind the leather pants. About 15 years ago, a man came to our church in his whole motorcycle outfit, and he had a pair of Harley Davidson leather pants on. And I just said to him in passing, man, I, I wish I could be as cool as you. The next week, he brought me a pair of Harley Davidson leather pants that he bought at Gatto's uh, in Tarentum and gifted them to me. And from time to time, when I want to feel really cool, I wear them. I'm also wearing my uh, black and gold tennis shoes. Now, these are not any normal, ordinary tennis shoes. They're steel-toed tennis shoes. Just in case you need a pair of steel-toed uh, black and gold tennis shoes, I picked these up at a second-hand store for 50 bucks. so I thought I could wear those again this year for the first time. And um, so today, uh, now that we got all of this out of the way, <laughs> I want to uh, begin with just a simple story. It's a story that I heard the first time this week, and it's a fascinating story. Uh, there was a successful magazine entrepreneur who was sharing his story at a Toastmasters event. And he was telling about how when he was a high school junior, how he was failing out of his classes. He wasn't attending uh, school. He was skipping classes uh, and he was doing poorly in school. He was being raised by a single mother in the Midwest who was doing the best that she could. And he promised her at her urging, he promised her that he would take the SAT test, that college entrance test that many take. Um, and so he decided that he would go ahead and take the test. Didn't have much uh, excitement about it, didn't think it was gonna do very much. Uh, now, if you don't know the college SAT test, it has a mathematical section that scores it 500 points, then it has a, a language English verbal section that scores it 800 points for the math, 800 points for the other section. So the most you could get is 1600. So he took the test and a few weeks went by when his results of this test came in the mail. He was stunned to see that he scored 1480 points on the SAT test. It blew his mind. He showed his test results to his mother and she immediately asked, did you cheat? And he confessed, no, I, I wanted to, I tried to, but with the little dots and this and that, I couldn't figure out how to cheat. So no, I just, I just took the test. Well, with his newfound SAT scores, he thought, boy, I'm a lot brighter than I thought I was. I better start um, going to class. So he started attending class and then entered his senior year and realized that college was something that he wanted to move towards. So he went to a local community college and then he went to uh, Wichita State to college and then eventually to an Ivy League school. Uh, people would say to him, everything in your life changed when you got a 1,480 point score on your SAT. And he would argue with them, no, that's not when everything changed. That's not what made everything change, that score. Everything changed when I started acting like I got the 1,480 on my SAT, SAT scores. Interestingly enough, 13 years later, he's a successful 
magazine entrepreneur. He gets a letter from Princeton, New Jersey, which I believe is where the SATs kind of are headquartered. And uh, he didn't open it. His wife asked him the next day, aren't you going to open your letter? And he said, oh, yeah, okay. So he opened it and read, they were notifying him that an error had been made regarding his SATs, that they do an audit uh, occasionally. And the year that he took his SATs, 13 people were sent the wrong test scores. He'd actually scored 740 on his SATs, not 1480. But everything changed for him when he began to act like a 1480 SAT student. We are in our series of messages just simply called The Way. And we're looking at the way of Jesus as described in the book of Mark. And last week, we, we talked about, or two weeks ago actually, two weeks ago we talked about the way that Jesus describes and defines the way in Mark chapter 8. And in this chapter, Jesus says the way, the way to be my disciple is to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. This is the way of Jesus. Now, many people bear the name Christian, and yet they don't act like they're a follower of Christ. They don't act like they're following the way. We observed that when you're denying yourself, that you are actually letting go of something. When you deny yourself, you elevate someone else. You elevate others. Uh, you empty what's in your hand so that you can pick up your cross. You embrace the cross of Christ and the calling that he has given us to follow him. We engage in this relationship with Christ and the journey of following and then we enjoy, we experience joy in transformational ways. This is the way of Jesus. I liked how somebody said it uh, when they said that God formed us, sin deformed us. The Bible informs us, but Jesus transforms us. God transforms us and Jesus calls us to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. Well, today, Jesus explains in even clearer terms what it looks like to follow him, what it looks like to follow the way. So we're going to look today at Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Now, this is a fascinating this is a fascinating passage of scripture that I would love to invite you to read the entire passage this week, the entire chapter this week. I promised Matt, whom I'm filming with, that it was going to be a shorter sermon than normal uh, because normally I would read the entire chapter, but we're just going to look at verses 30 through 37, and then we're going to end with verse 50. And I'm filming today in the nursery of the Church of God's building in Lower Borough at 273 Chester Drive. Um, more about that in just a bit. Verse 30 begins, they left that place, and if you wanna know what place they left, Jesus and the disciples, feel free to go back and read it yourself. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Now, Jesus told them of his impending death in the previous chapter, and that's when Peter stood up against him and said, no, 
This will not be in Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> so because none of the disciples wanted to be called Satan again, verse 32 says, but they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. <laughs> so this is the second time Jesus tells them plainly, I am going to die on the third day. I will rise again. But they still did not grasp it. Verse 33, they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? So Jesus, uh, ever paying attention and noticing everything, he noticed that the disciples were having an argument as they walked along. And Jesus knew what they were talking about. He didn't need them to fill him in on this. He was asking them because he wanted to hear them tell him what they argue, were arguing about. But verse 34, but they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. <laughs> now, I just want to contrast. It says here, on the way. And I want to contrast the way of Jesus with the disciples on the way or their way. Jesus says, to be great, you must deny yourself pick up your cross and follow me. And yet the disciples, after hearing this message so clearly, they still want to argue about who's the greatest. Now, it's funny how our own insecurities about who we are make us want to posture ourselves up and boost ourselves up and elevate our importance. And time and time and time again, you see this nature of the disciples coming out, wanting to prove how important they are, wanting to be considered the greatest. And so Jesus wants them to see clearly what being the greatest looks like. Kyle Mercer is a pastor who was in Pastor Mark's youth group years ago, and he pastors Two Cities Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Now, I'm excited to quote Kyle in that area because my father grew up in High Point, real close to Winston-Salem. That's where my grandparents on my dad's side are from, so I have fond memories of anything along those lines from that area. Well, Kyle says this, when we see need or pain in other people's problems, we immediately figure out a way to distance ourselves from that person in the most kind, polite way as possible. When we look over our life, some of us will realize that our whole life, maybe not intentionally, has been designed not to interact with people in need. I want, I want to invite you to sit with that a moment and just look at the times in your life that you have arranged your schedule, arranged walking the other way in the aisle in a store because you see somebody that you know is in need and you want to go another way. You got it? Have you thought of a time? Well, Kyle was saying, to be honest, some of us have arranged our entire life so that we never have to interact with someone who is in need. Because when someone is in need and we interact with them, what do we stand to have happen? We, have, we stand to have happen this notion of being interrupted, that it might actually cost us something, might cost us our resources, might cost us time. It will definitely be an interruption and an inconvenience. Well, Kyle continues. He says, what if your only hope in life was the unexpected, extravagant love from someone from whom you don't deserve it? What if that's your only hope in life? Oh, what if you're hanging by a thread and you, you need Jesus to send someone to you 
that can give you and express to you extraordinary love and grace and compassion that you don't deserve. But the reality is I didn't deserve it either. This is a picture of the gospel, Kyle continues. Jesus is not just the good Samaritan. He is the great Samaritan who got personally involved. He, uh, he gave his time, his resources, his energy, himself. He gave himself completely for us and our salvation. Kyle says, I could try to convince you, you got to help homeless people. You got to help your neighbor. But that won't last. The only way we can be the servant God has called us to be long term is when we realize that Jesus Christ did all of this for us first. He didn't pass by on the other side of the road, but he had compassion and courage and went to us individually and brought help, hope, and healing. Now, Kyle says the only way we shift from being a self-focused individual to being a servant is by understanding what Jesus did for us. And I would also add to that that the most helpful way that that gets transformed in us is when we see someone else doing it and when we get to serve and help alongside of someone else i'm i'm happy to um, just let you know that through the operation christmas child efforts of the river new kensington and the river franklin park and the members from the Church of God in Lower Borough who united together with us, that we were able to send out this past week over 250 shoeboxes filled with gifts for boys and girls all over the world that will hear the gospel presented to them through your generosity. That is serving on a worldwide level. Now, I, I want to get, I want to get the shoebox that I heard that one of our parishioners went above and beyond, that they spent like $150 to fill each shoebox. Can, can you imagine that kid opening that shoebox <laughs> and being blown away by the generosity of the person? Now, compare that to the shoeboxes we presented where we got everything from the Dollar Tree. <laughs> Well, I, I just want to say the love of what you expressed is huge. And I want to thank you for being a church that sees beyond itself. And this Christmas season, we are reminded of those who are in need. And so I want to ask you to come together and serve with us as we have one additional opportunity this Christmas season to help and bless and feed others. This coming Sunday, December 10th, at the River Franklin Park and also at the River New Kensington, we are going to be packaging a total of 20,000 meals that are gonna be shipped across the, country, across the world to places that are struggling, to places where the population is at risk to places that people need a warm meal given with extraordinary love. Now, each campus will be packaging uh, 10,000 meals each. Uh, these meals will consist of rice and lentils and additional things that can be transported and bless those in need. And so I want to ask you to join us at 1130 next Sunday, December 10th, and come and package these meals with us at 200 Freeport Road in New Kensington or on Wari Drive at the River Franklin Park over in Franklin Park 
because we are gonna be blessing and helping and serving others. Our youth group did this a few years ago and they were blessed as they prepared two pallets of meals for those in need. And so I wanna invite you to deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow Jesus, and come and serve together with us as we commit to bless others. Jesus continues when he realized, not when he realizes, but when the disciples, he asks them what they were talking about, what they were arguing about, and they were arguing about who's the most important, who's the greatest. Jesus wants to give them an object lesson. He wants to show them something. Verse 35 says, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Jesus is saying, do you want to be great? Do you want to know what is really involved in being the greatest? Let me tell you, let me show you. First of all, you have to serve. You have to serve. You have to bless. You have to help. As a parent, this has been my number one lesson I've tried to teach my children from the beginning of time, that they are called to serve and bless and help each other and others. Jesus wanted to help them with this as well. Now, sometimes out of our own secure insecurities, we don't feel like we're that big of a deal. <laughs> we don't feel like we can make that big of a difference. Well, I love this quote by J.K. Chesterton. He says, the most extraordinary thing in the world is an ordinary man and an ordinary woman and their ordinary children. Being ordinary and being ordinarily yielded to Christ and being inordinarily ordin, ordin, in or ordinarily, I don't know, you know what I'm trying to say, but committed to being a servant, it's the most extraordinary thing in the world. So Jesus has now a visual aid to help show him. It says he took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Now, I wanted to film in this nursery space today um, because this nursery space is a sacred space because of the ministry that has taken place in this nursery over the years. Uh, you may not know this, but this nursery has been dedicated to the memory of Reese Mackay Leslie. Reese was born in May of 1976 to Jim and Karen Leslie, and Reese was born with spina bifida. And the doctors advised that they might want to consider surgery to help their newborn child, but they felt very strongly that they would let God make the decision on the future of this child. And unfortunately, within three weeks, Reese Mackay Leslie passed away. And Jim and Karen Leslie dedicated the redecorating of this nursery space in the summer of 1976 to the memory of their young child. They wanted it to be a place where young infants are taken care of and valued and treasured. Last Sunday, I saw this in action. Last Sunday at the river in New Kensington, we had Teen Challenge come and share their story. And Richard Rockkind, a very passionate Pentecostal preacher, preached a message with more energy than you could ever imagine. He had that uh, 
uh, cadence in his preaching where every time he finished making a statement, he would take a breath and it would sound like this. <gasps> and then he would continue. And I was like so afraid he was going to pass out. But that's how he preaches. And it was great. After the second service, I saw a friend of mine, Eric Dzinski, and I noticed he was there because he was helping in the nursery in the first service. He and his wife have volunteered in our nursery and his wife had to work. So he was there alone taking care of a precious 20 month old uh, little girl in the nursery, also known as my granddaughter. Um, and I was so moved that he was just doing that in a way that was a blessing to her and blessing to her parents so that they could experience the service. But I noticed he wasn't in the second service either. And I asked him when I saw him after church in the second service, I said, how come you didn't make it into the service? He said, well, uh, somehow we didn't have coverage for the nursery in the second service. And a young couple brought their two-year-old. And I thought, man, I want them to experience the service. And so I want them to be in there and I'll stay and watch their daughter in this service, which he did. And I said, man, Eric, that is a, it's a very Christ-like thing you did. This week, his wife, Kathy, called me up and said, Dean, when we move into the building at 273 Chester Drive, um, I, I'm not sure what space we're going to use for the nursery. And I said, well, we're going to use the larger space, uh, the, the large office space. We're going to renovate that and make that the entire nursery so that young families know that their children matter to us and are taken care of. And she said, well, I have a favor to ask. Would you mind if Eric and I um, painted that room in, in preparation for that once the colors are chosen? I'm like, no, I, I wouldn't mind that at all. And she goes, would, would you mind if we possibly got a few things to help make that a great space? And I'm like, no, I, I wouldn't mind that at all. And, and, then, and then she said, you know, Dean, it's really important to us that that nursery has coverage for every single service, that there are uh, adults and, and youth that can help care for our most vulnerable and fragile parishioners at the river and provide a space for them to be blessed while their parents get to enjoy God's presence in worship and hear the word. Um, would, would it be okay if I, if Eric and I made sure that every service was covered? And I said, well, you know, that's going to require some conversations with people and and recruiting people to this vision that you have for this nursery. And she said, I, I understand. Would you allow us to do that? And I said, well, Kathy, it, it sounds a whole lot like you and Eric are volunteering to oversee our nursery at the church and make sure that that space is served and blessed with excellence and commitment and love. And she goes, well, I guess that's exactly what I'm asking. just an ordinary husband and wife volunteering to do an ordinary act of service that will provide extraordinary space for God to work and move. Do you want to be great? Serve. Secondly, Jesus tells us in this text, if you want to be great, then salt. Wait, salt's a noun. Yeah, but salt is also a verb. And Jesus says in verse 50, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. Jesus is telling his disciples to be like salt in their relationship with each other. Now we know in the days that Jesus spoke this, that salt was used in primarily three ways. It was used as a preservative to preserve meats because they didn't have refrigeration. It was also used as an agent of healing to help bring healing to wounds. But salt as we know it primarily today, other than in Western Pennsylvania when we use it to keep the sidewalks free, free from freezing ice, um, salt is used to bring flavor. And Jesus is inviting his disciples, Jesus is inviting us to live lives that are salty, that help preserve 
things that help bring healing and that bring flavor where flavor is needed. If you noticed in this message today, I didn't bring uh, the title of the sermon up because I wanted to save it to the end. The title of today's sermon is just simply called Dunkirk. Yes, once again, we found a movie title that conveys the essence of this sermon. And Dunkirk was a film that released in in 2017, and it told the story of 1940 in World War II when 300,000 British soldiers were trapped in France on the beach in Dunkirk with the ocean on one side and the German army trapping them in on the other. And they were like sitting ducks on the beach and the Germans were bringing air raids to destroy them and blow them up and and wipe off the face of the earth these 3,000 troops from England, from the British army, the British armed forces. So a call went out from over in England, 21 miles away across the England Channel, English Channel for any boat owner to go across the English Channel, this 21-mile journey, to the beach in Dunkirk to pick up and rescue these 300,000 trapped soldiers. And so 850 boats owned by private individuals and businesses went and came to the rescue. The smallest boat, here's a picture of it, it's, it was the Tamzine. It was a 15 foot long boat. You're like, what good is that gonna do for 300,000 soldiers? Well, that boat traversed the 21 mile journey across the English Channel and where the largest, the larger ships were not able to get up to the beach to rescue the soldiers, the Tamzine went and got soldiers from the beach and transported them to the larger vessels, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It is estimated that it rescued hundreds of soldiers. This one simple 15-foot boat that is now in a museum over in Britain. I know sometimes when we look at the grandness of the kingdom of God and advancing the kingdom, we can feel like, I I can't do much. I'm just an ordinary person. But an ordinary person committed to living the way who understands that serving and blessing and helping is at the core of what living the kingdom life is is about and a ordinary follower of Christ willing to live like salt and bring flavor and healing to this mixed up world we live in an ordinary person fully yielded to God and living the way will be blessed by God in extraordinary ways and will advance the kingdom of God in extraordinary ways because they have chosen the extraordinary way of living, the way of Jesus. May you live this way. May your life be a life of service and healing and flavor. May you pick up your cross deny yourself, and follow Christ fully. Amen. God bless you, everybody. I can't wait till I get to see you again on our first Sunday in December, the 19-year anniversary of the River Church. God bless you all. Have a great week.